Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and homo sapiens of all ages. Welcome to this evening's festivities. Tonight, we are going to take a journey deep into a wild, mysterious corner of the animal kingdom. Tonight, we will descend into the wonderful world of invertebrates. Invertebrates are animals that share one very peculiar characteristic. They all have no spines. Some of them, like crabs, have exoskeletons, which means that their bones are on the outside. Others, like octopuses, have no bones at all. Some of them, like jellyfish, live deep underwater. Others, like earthworms, live underground. Many of them, like bees and butterflies, can fly through the air. And some, like spiders, live among us. The first invertebrates we will meet this evening are ants. Ants live in huge families called colonies, which are divided into three main castes. Most ants are members of the first caste, the all-female worker caste. These workers perform important tasks, like foraging for food, building the nest, and defending the colony. The second caste is the all-male drone caste, the primary function of which is reproduction. The third and final caste, the royal caste, has only one member, the ant queen, the mother of the colony. sun slip above the horizon, the courtiers of the Ant Queen file into the royal chamber, eagerly awaiting the morning levy. Only the Queen's most trusted entertainers are admitted to the ceremony. The lady-in-waiting, the maid of honor, the keeper of the larvae, the mistress of Miracocchere. Before the court elite, at the heart of the royal chamber, the queen reclines in a magnificent eight-post estate bed, veiled from her attendants by a heavy brocade of sumptuous spider-spun silk. With practice gentility, the lady-in-waiting draws back the bed curtains, revealing her majesty. Every courtier knows her role. First, the lady-in-waiting gently rouses the monarch from her slumber. With a refinement befitting her regal status, the mother of the colony luxuriously stretches her wings. Tiny, impractical appendages which serve as reminders of her absolute supremacy before allowing the lady-in-waiting to adorn her in full imperial regalia. With a hoop-skirted bum roll, amplifying her already swollen abdomen, the Queen Regent receives her morning kiss from the Maid of Honor. Meanwhile, the Keeper of the Larvae discreetly collects any eggs the Queen might have laid during the night and carries them off to the nursery.
Ready for the day, the Ant Queen proceeds towards her throne. Workers, soldiers, and drones alike all kneels before her. are some of the smallest and most prolific invertebrates on the planet, the world's largest spineless animal happens to be one of the rarest. Like a creature from a Viking saga, this mysterious, reclusive monster lives in the deepest recesses of the coldest ocean in the world. It is known as the Colossal Squid. Deeper than the sunlight can reach, the frigid depths of the Antarctic Ocean. Something hungry, something colossal, hunting, hiding, waiting, watching, lurking. Slippery muscles, rows of hooks line tender flesh, huge glowing eyes scan the darkness. Listen, in the distance. A haunting moan, a wail on the hunt. Icy fear ripples from mantle to tentacle. Danger.
A quiet, fluid flurry. A puff of glowing ink. Eight arms slip into the yawning void. Downwards. Deeper. Darker. Colder. Down. Down. Control, this is House Fly 375, over. Psh. 375, go ahead. We're checking in. Fox Truck, Lima Yankee, please acknowledge, over. Roger, 375. Target at 3.7 knots closure. Delta 2, do you have a visual? Affirmative. Target is wearing a black coat with uh, black pants and a ponytail. Does she have a swatter? Negative, just a baton. Delta leader to control, standing by. Request permission to engage. Over. Permission granted. Go get him, 375. Okay, boys and girls, keep your eyes peeled. You've got thousands of microvillar federal receptors for a reason. Going in. Charlie at 3 o'clock high. I've been painted! Roger that, Delta-3. Give me 15 degrees, nose up! I can't shake him! He's right on my tail! We lost Delta-3. This is Control. Come in, 375. Do you copy? Over. That's a Roger. Delta-3 is down. Over. 10-4. 375. Your new vector is 0, 2, 0 degrees. Heading north, northwest. Roger that. Turning around to re-engage target. Delta leader to squadron. Come hard left, heading 180. Right with you, skipper. Roger, Delta leader. Okay, give me some altitude. Let's level off at 3,000 millimeters. Two seconds to target. Four meters in closing. Target nine o'clock low. Engage! I've been padlocked! Break right and bug out! I'm coming back to cover your run! Woo! Woo! Son of Tsitsi! Delta-4 bought the farm. 175 to control. Delta-4 is down. I repeat, Delta-4 is down. Roger, 375. Initial point. New heading, 287. Vector 120 and make angle 20. Over. Roger that. Okay, Delta-2. You're my dash 2. Let's show this conductor what we're made of. Roger, Delta leader. Engage! There we go, Delta-2. Pull up! 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 Skipper! Three seventy-five to control. I read you, three seventy-five. What's wrong? Over. I'm the last one, sir. Delta two is gone. Courage, Captain. Fight on and fly on to the last drop of hemolymph, to the last beat of the heart. Roger. Here goes nothing. Delta one over and out.
It is dawn on the savannah. The warm red glow of the rising sun floods the African sky, heralding the end of night and the beginning of a new day. In the dim lights of the early morning, a lioness stalks her prey in a final attempt at hunting while the grassland around her slowly comes to life. A troop of baboons perched in the branches of an acacia tree stir from their slumber as a giraffe lazily nibbles the leaves below them. The high-pitched brain of a zeal of zebra sounds nearby. All throughout the plains, the waist-high grass barely manages to conceal the disgusting, stinking, fly-covered product of last night's activities. A vast littering of dung. There's elephant dung. Wildebeest dung. Rhinoceros dung. Hyena dung. Ostrich dung. And even warthog dung. As the sun climbs higher into the sky, bathing the savanna below in withering, desiccating heat, all this dung begins to cook. Heat shimmers on the horizon as sickening vapors fill the air, transforming the grassland into a veritable bouquet of stench. Far below the sweltering sun, under the baboons and their acacia tree, and beneath all the dung, another creature begins to stir. This lone scarab, a powerful little beetle encased in thick, plated armor, crawls from its burrow, delighted by the fetid fecal fragrance. It raises its antenna to the air and catches a whiff of excrement. Ah, delicious. Soon, the solitary beetle is joined by a companion, another scarab similarly entranced by the sickling sweet aroma of fresh manure, relishing the prospect of a nice hot meal. In no time, the two beetles are joined by a third, and soon after by a fourth, each one emerging from a different hole in the ground. quickly swells to a flood as hundreds of ravenous tongue beetles pour from their underground layers, all summoned by the same aerobic call to arms. Guided by their appetites, the troops assemble into battle formations. Columns of auxiliary stream across the savanna floor to join the horde. New recruits fall in line with a grim sense of purpose. Nothing will stand in their way.
In unison, the insectile legionnaires march off to meet their dinner. Clouds of flies scatter before them. Dust settles in their wake. The dog doesn't stand a chance. parts of the world, scarabs devour balls of dung all year long, much to the benefit of their neighbors. Another invertebrate, however, comes out to play far less frequently. In the spring or summer, the luna moth begins its life as a caterpillar. After spinning a cocoon around itself, it metamorphoses into one of the largest moths in North America with long, streaming tails and pale green wings that almost seem to glow in the moonlight. This nocturnal insect graces the North, North American skies for no more than seven nights, beautiful and fleeting as the cherry blossom. Fanning beneath the summer moon, elegant wings, paler than the grass, ephemeral as the dew.
Long, long ago, before Moses parted the Red Sea, before killer whales cruised the Pacific, before plesiosaurs looked the Loch Ness, the ocean floor was dominated by slippery, spineless creatures and vertebrae. In those days, food was scarce, and only the hungriest survived. Eat or be eaten was the law of the sea, a law that one little starfish learned the hard way. It was a day like any other on the floor of the Panthalassic Ocean 450 million years ago. Huge ten-armed sea scorpions prowled the sea floor, while cone-shelled, tentacle-mouthed nautiloids glided above. Here and there, trilobites lay hidden, their bodies half-submerged in the sediment, their eyes protruding from the sand like periscopes. In the midst of it all, one solitary starfish crawled about, searching for food, blissfully unaware that he was being watched. Up ahead, the starfish spied a patch of algae growing just beyond the shadow of a huge, misshapen orange rock. Using hundreds of tiny, hair-like tube feet, he scuttled over to the algae, checked his surroundings for predators, and crawled on top of his dinner. That accomplished, he pushed his stomach out through his mouth, secreting digestive juices that slowly dissolved the algae into a nutritious, absorbable sludge. Satisfied, the little starfish proceeded to gorge himself. So intent was the starfish upon finishing his dinner that it took him some time to realize that something was terribly amiss. As he ate, he glanced about, spurred by a formless, instinctive twinge of dread. His eyes came to rest upon the huge, misshapen orange rock that was sitting next to him. His skin crawled with horror as it dawned on him that the rock was watching him with little beady black eyes. The rock was, in fact, another much larger starfish, and he was ravenous. The little starfish made the first move. Abandoning his dinner, he spun on his stomach and fled for safety, crawling as fast as his little hair-like legs could carry him. Terrified, he chanced to glance behind him. The larger starfish was in hot pursuit. Away they raced, past algae and rocks and a fearful trilobite who watched the spectacle unfold through gangling eyes. His heart hammering in his abdomen, the little starfish stole another glance at his pursuer. barreling towards him at appalling speed, covering millimeters of ground in mere seconds. Resolute to the point of madness, his tiny black eyes, devoid of any semblance of mercy or compassion, glinted instead with a ferocious, mindless veracity seldom seen in the natural world. 
horrified. The little star of his crooked his pace, pushing his body to the limit of its endurance. Yet incredibly, the monster seemed to be gaining ground. With ghastly finality, the little starfish felt an iron limb clamp onto his own. He struggled in vain as the abomination crawled on top of him and squirmed with revulsion as he felt a stomach press into his back. In the sand nearby, the trilobites watched as the little starfish was slowly eaten alive. And now, this is what the larger starfish had to say as he savored his well-earned dinner. Ah, a dish for royalty. The outer shell is pleasantly crunchy, while the flesh beneath is soft and moist. Oh, it literally melts in your mouth. The first impression is one of agreeable pungency, like the smell of a beach at low tide. The meat exudes complex notes of sea salt and sulfur, complemented by the full-bodied piquancy of rotten fish. Absolutely delectable. Do I detect a subtle spiciness on the back end? Oh, yes. There is a distinctive tang, the merest hint of acridity, the flattering aftertaste of digestive enzymes. All in all, wonderful, truly wonderful. Now, my friends, this is goodbye. Thank you, each and every one. We hope you leave this evening with a fresh perspective of our world's abundant, spineless inhabitants. Farewell, dear humans, and good night to all. <laughs>